At 8.48 on the 2nd of April 1942, the USS Hornet aircraft carrier steams under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and heads out to sea with her escort fleet. 16 B-25 Mitchell medium bombers can be seen on her flight deck. The locals assume the bombers are simply being transported to Hawaii. After all, bombers of that size are surely far too large to be able to actually take off from an aircraft carrier. In December 1941, the Empire of Japan attacked the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor, bringing the United States into World War II. Simultaneously, Japan also took the US territories of Guam, the Philippines and Wake Island. The American people were furious at these attacks on their territories and demanded revenge. President Roosevelt inquired about the feasibility of bombing raids on Japan. The US needed a morale boost. However, the loss of airfields on the occupied Pacific Islands rendered the US unable to reach Japan with the range of its conventional bomber air power. At a naval airfield in Virginia, testing was carried out whereby the outline of the deck of an aircraft carrier was drawn out on a runway, and medium bombers attempted to take off within the required distance of 467 feet. It was possible with major modifications, but only just. An attempt in the high seas of the Pacific Ocean would be quite a different matter. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle, an engineer before the war and now famous military test pilot, sketched out a plan where medium bombers would take off from an aircraft carrier off the coast of Japan and strike the greater Tokyo area. Landing back on the aircraft carrier after the raid would be impossible, so he considered that the strike force would continue west after their raid and land in the Soviet Union turning the aircraft over to the Soviet Air Force as Lend-Lease. However, while the Soviets were fighting with the Allies in the war against Germany, they were still neutral with Japan. Stalin did not want a second front to open in the Far East with Japan at a time when Germany was hammering the Soviet Union to the west. Doolittle revised his plan to land the aircraft in China. With the B-25s modified for long-range operations, they were craned onto the deck of the USS Hornet and on the 2nd of April, the ship steamed west. The force from San Francisco, Task Force 18, consists of the USS Hornet aircraft carrier, cruisers Nashville and Vincennes, Euler Cimarron, and destroyers Gwyn, Meredith, Monson and Grayson. On the 8th of April, the Euler Cimarron refuels the destroyers, whose range is limited, in stormy seas. In Pearl Harbor, Task Force 16, led by Admiral Halsey, puts to sea. Made up of the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier, cruisers Northampton and Salt Lake City, Euler Sabine and destroyers Balch, Benham, Ellet and Fanning. The fleet leaves the Navy base and heads towards grid reference 38 North, 180 East. They are to rendezvous with Task Force 18 on the 13th of April, before the combined fleet heads west. Thousands of miles away, off the coast of Japan, the USS submarines Trout and Thresher have been attacking and sinking Japanese merchant shipping. They monitor the weather and feedback radio reports to the fleet. On the 17th, the task force is 800 miles from the Japanese coast. All ships resupply from the oilers Cimarron and Sabine. The two oilers then turn east for home. The destroyers hold at this position to save valuable fuel for the later voyage home. The rest of the task force continues west. The carrier USS Enterprise is providing air cover to the fleet, as the USS Hornet cannot launch any of its own combat wing, while the bombers take up the deck space. Recon aircraft are launched to search an area 200 miles ahead of the fleet for hostile shipping. At 3am on the 18th of April, the fleet detects two surface radar contacts at 20,000 yards distance. Halsey orders a course change away to avoid detection. At 4am, the fleet resumes its course towards Japan. At sunrise, air patrols resume from the Enterprise. This time, three Dauntless dive bombers are also dispatched to search for the surface contacts detected overnight. One aircraft sights a ship at 42 miles ahead of the task force, and drops a note onto the deck of the Enterprise so as to preserve radio silence. At 8am, the fleet spots the Japanese patrol craft Nita Maru at 10,000 yards. 
the USS Nashville opens fire and sinks the craft, but not before it was able to radio back a warning to the Japanese homeland. Enemy carriers spotted. Admiral Halsey realizes the element of surprise has been lost, and every minute passed is a minute longer the Japanese military has to prepare for the attack. Ten hours early, and 170 miles further away than planned, he gives the order to launch the bombers. First into the air, Doolittle leads the 16 B-25 Mitchells in successfully completing the perilous takeoff. Remarkably, no aircraft are lost, and the bombers set course for Tokyo. The task force turns back to the east, knowing there are further patrol craft in the area ready to radio back the location of the fleeing ships to long-range bombers on the mainland. With the B-25s launched, Hornet can now launch its own air wing to help defend the fleet. Over the next few hours, Hornet launches eight Wildcat fighters on combat air patrols, and Enterprise launches Dauntlesses in 200-mile search patterns for enemy ships. Enterprise detects Japanese recon aircraft at long range, but they turn away. At 2pm, the fleet spots two patrol craft to the north. Dauntlesses attack and destroy the first, but return fire from the craft damages one Dauntless, which crashes into the sea near the USS Nashville. The Nashville closes in and destroys the remaining ship with the aid of dive bombers from Hornet. To the west, the 16 bombers are approaching the Japanese coast. They split into five formations. The first will hit northern Tokyo, the second central Tokyo, the third southern Tokyo, the fourth spreads out over a 50 mile front on its way to Kanagawa, Yokohama and Yokosuka Navy Base. The fifth will hit Nagoya and Kobe. The first three flights, 13 aircraft, surround Tokyo and run in from different directions. The targets are selected military and civilian factories and oil refineries. Notably, the Nippon Electric Company and the Mitsubishi Aircraft Company. Japanese observer posts have spotted the bombers crossing the coast, and an intercepting fighter force comprising Zeros, KI-27s and KI-61s have been scrambled. The targets selected are specifically chosen for their scattered nature throughout the Greater Tokyo area. The plan is to cause as much shock to civilians as possible across the widest possible area. Nearly all bombers are pursued and attacked by multiple fighters. Doolittle himself is attacked by nine enemy aircraft. The city's anti-aircraft batteries open a desperate barrage of fire on the bombers, but their low altitude and flight paths make them impossible targets. The gunners on the US aircraft claim five fighters shot down in self-defense. It's a defensive disaster for the Japanese, who score no bombers destroyed. Nearly all planned targets are hit, including damage to an aircraft carrier in dry dock at Yokosuka. Two aircraft attack multiple targets in Nagoya. They encounter heavy anti-aircraft fire before bombing a military barracks, an oil storage facility and two aircraft factories. The last aircraft follows the coastline into the port of Kobe and drops bombs on a steelworks, electric works and the Kawasaki dockyard and aircraft factory. All bombers except one turn for China to make their escape. Captain Edward York's aircraft makes for the Soviet Union. An administrative error led to unauthorized modifications to York's engine carburetors before leaving the US mainland. This means that fuel consumption is vastly higher than has been planned for, and China will now be 300 miles out of range. York's crew has no choice but to make for Vladivostok in the Soviet Union. They would eventually land safely, but are interned by the Soviet Union. A month later, the Soviet government would stage their supposed escape near the Iranian border, allowing the crew to travel to the British consulate in Iran. The crew would return home soon after, without the Soviets appearing to have broken the neutrality agreement with Japan. All crews are forced to bail out near or before their planned landing areas in China, thanks to unusually high wind and fog. When communicating the plan to the Chinese military in the days leading up to the attack, a mistake was made by US planners, forgetting that the raid would involve crossing the international dateline, 
the Chinese have been told to await the bombers 24 hours after intended. All but two crews aiming for China returned home with help from the Chinese. Doolittle received the Medal of Honor as leader of the raid. The other two crews were captured by the Japanese. Regretfully, after a military trial, three of the crew members were executed, with another dying of malnutrition in prison. Japanese reprisals on China for harboring the crews were severe, launching Operation Saigo in May to occupy the coastal areas to prevent their use as a bomber landing area again. Estimates for civilian fatalities during the campaign range from 70 to 250,000 people. There was a major boost to American morale. More importantly, the Japanese High Command now considered their coastline vulnerable to attack. They would attempt to take the Pacific Islands of Midway two months later to try to hinder US carrier operations against their mainland in the future. The resulting Battle of Midway would be a crippling defeat for the Japanese Navy, and decisive in the war in the Pacific.